This is Mark Syme. I'm the minister of the Northfield Church of Christ here in Northfield, New Jersey. And these are the PM services for Sunday, May the 23rd. We will be singing from Songs of Faith and Praise. Um, Jane is still in Kansas. She's getting in late tomorrow night. And so uh, my accompaniment is uh, Ron and Terry Clevenger. So uh, I am blessed uh, to have them uh, here and uh, to use their good voices to drown out my voice itself. So if you would please uh, turn your songbooks to number 792. Leave them there because the next song will be 791. So don't don't uh, get too quick on the trigger and close your songbook after the first song. Number 792, My Eyes Are Dry. My eyes are dry, my faith is all my heart is hard, my prayers are cold and I know how I ought to be. Lovely. Number 791, the song right across the page. 791. On bended knee I come, with a humble heart I come, bowing down before your own. Holy and do you as I pledge my love on you? I worship you in spirit, I worship you in truth. Make my life a holy prayer. Hard I come, bowing down before your holy throne. As I look upon your face, show your mercy and your Change my life, O oh Holy Spirit. Make me fresh and ever new. Make my life a holy sacrifice to you. Ron will lead us in our opening prayer. All right, let's pray. Our God, we just come before you tonight and thank you for uh, this amount of time that we can praise you and worship you and get into your word. Our God, we just uh, continue to pray for 
uh, healing for Elizabeth and for Andres that they would just continue to recover from their surgeries. Uh, Lord, we just pray that you would be with Jane as she travels back uh, later on this week. Just ha uh, give her a safe flight home. And we pray that you would be with us uh, throughout this week. Help us to do your will and glorify you in all that we do. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. And the song before the Lord's Supper is number 77. Seventy-seven. Father, we love you, we worship and adore you. Glorify thy name in all the and adore you. Glorify thy name in all the earth. Glorify thy name. Glorify thy name. Glorify thy name in all the earth. Spirit, we love you, we worship and adore you. Glorify thy name in all the Glorify thy name, glorify thy name in all the earth. We come to the part of our service where we uh, observe the Lord's Supper. We are commanded on the first day of the week to uh, gather together to break bread. And uh, we pretty much believe that that scripture from Acts chapter 20 and verse 7 means the breaking of bread that uh, involves uh, the partaking of the Lord's Supper. Uh, as far as I know, it's not to be done on Saturday. It's not to be done on uh, Monday. It is to be observed, observed on the Lord's Day. Uh, it's one of the uh, things that makes the Lord's Day so special that uh, we just take time out to remember the death and the burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ, uh, the Messiah, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Uh, it is so wonderful to understand that this was God's plan from the beginning of time uh, in his all-knowing uh, way uh, that uh, we really cannot fathom, but uh, we do know that uh, Jesus uh, was to come to earth as he did and um, that he died and that he died a, a terrible death uh, that he suffered and he suffered terribly and that most importantly he made the one and perfect sacrifice for you and I so that those type of sacrifices would not have to be made again he allowed his body to be battered. He allowed his blood to be spilled. He didn't cry out uh, until he commended his spirit back to the Father. And so with that in mind, 
uh, let's pray over the bread. Our Heavenly Father, we're so grateful that uh, in your infinite wisdom that uh, Jesus came to earth and taught us the truth of uh, the good news of the gospel. And we just prayed, dear Heavenly Father, that uh, we would take that teaching and, uh, and run with it. But we uh, take this time out to remember his ultimate death, his sacrifice, his uh, giving his life up that we might live, that he gave his body in our stead. As we take, partake of this bread, help us to remember that body. I pray this in Jesus' most holy name. Amen. And according to the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and after this they took the cup. And uh, we are supposed to drink of that cup in, in, uh, in a symbolic way, remembering the blood that Jesus shed, the blood that washes our sins away, the blood that releases us from the guilt of those sins. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we, you know, we gasp at the thought of our Savior, uh, of the blood that poured down his side, that poured from that uh, crown of thorns that was about his head. And uh, we marvel at that sacrifice, yet we realize that that one-time sacrifice, that the shedding of his blood meant that we could be free uh, from the guilt of sin and have those sins forgiven. Help us, dear Heavenly Father, to learn that lesson and help us as we think of our sins being forgiven, that we will be forgiving people in our lives. We pray this in Jesus' most holy name. Amen. And as the Lord's Supper is complete, we are also reminded that on the first day of the week, uh, Christians were to lay by in store uh, and uh, give as they had prospered. We have those wonderful examples of the Macedonians giving uh, when they didn't have. We have the uh, example of the widow who gave uh, literally everything that she had. And, uh, we just pray and in our hearts that uh, we will give with a, a cheerful heart and a cheerful mind. And we will give with the gratitude of the knowledge that we know that uh, these gifts are, are going back to you. They will be put into a, a place where hopefully uh, others can be brought to Jesus Christ. Now let's pray for the giving, please. Help us, dear Heavenly Father, to give with a cheerful heart because we know that you do indeed love a cheerful giver. Help us, dear Heavenly Father, to always make our giving as part of our weekly plan, actually as part of our monthly and yearly plan that we will lay by in store as we have prospered and that we will give you back what is yours anyway. Help us to be generous and help us to understand what uh, giving back is all about. I pray this in Jesus' most holy name. Amen. And if you would turn your songbooks to number 578. Number 578. This is a peppy song, so keep up. We will glorify the King of Kings. We will glorify the Lamb. We will glorify the Lord of Lords, who is the great I Am. Lord, 
Jehovah reigns in majesty, we will bow before his throne. We will worship him in righteousness, we will worship him alone. He is Lord of heaven, Lord of earth, he is Lord of all who live. He is Lord above the universe, all praise to him we give. Hallelujah to the King of kings, hallelujah to the Lamb. Hallelujah to the Lord of lords, who is the great I am. That completes the singing part of our service to the Lord this evening. And now we will get into uh, the lesson. If you have been following along for the past couple of weeks, uh, you know that uh, I started a series two weeks ago called Bringers, B-R-I-N-G-E-R-S. And that has to do with our evangelistic efforts in bringing souls to Jesus Christ. We said there were three components to being a bringer. The first component is God. The second component is you and I. And the third component is the person who is sought, S-O-U-G-H-T, the, the hearer, if we would. And that's the one we will focus on this week. So let's just, uh, just review for just a moment or two. Uh, the God part is written in stone, right? Uh, the God part is the constant because God never changes. God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. The you and I part are, are a little more unique because as we try to spread the gospel, as we try to be the ones bringing souls to Jesus Christ, we find that uh, not everybody is receptive not everyone is ready, and uh, in many cases, many people just don't want to hear us. And so with that in mind, I, I guess once we have God's part laid out as being the constant, he's the one that we're trying to bring people to. And Perhaps we have our part, and I'm going to kind of overlap the, the I in evangelism, the you and I in evangelism, with the hearer. And so, first of all, how do we determine if someone is seeking? Do you remember the Verizon commercial of five or six years ago, the cell phone commercial? You remember it, don't you? Can you hear me now? How many times did you hear that? It was on TV at nauseum till we got sick of it. And we got so sick of it that we probably used it as part of our everyday jargon. If uh, someone wasn't listening, you might say, well, do you hear me now? And uh, everybody knows what we're talking about. I don't mean to make light of this, but... Um, that's what the hearer part is all about. <clears throat> In Romans chapter 10, verse 17, it says, Faith comes by hearing, and hearing through the word of God. And so the you and I that are to be the evangelistic people have to understand that there are hearers out there. There are possible seekers out there. And it is our job to uh, attempt to explain the gospel of Jesus Christ to them. And so, you know, it is, it's, it's almost uh, 
difficult to share uh, and think of the times that I have been confronted and said, well, how do we know if someone is seeking? And as bringers, we're the ones that have to master the ability to gauge others' interest in the gospel. And that isn't always easy. It's possible to offer too much at one time. It's possible to offer too little at one time. It's possible that we try to offer so much that we overwhelm people and we push them away. Uh, a little bit of genuineness, a little bit of kindness, and a little bit of courage obviously goes a long way. And so, as we attempt to identify who the seekers are, who the potential hearers are, we need to relate to people on some practical level. And I know this might not be the easiest thing, but we need to reach them where they are right now. It's a major tenant of teaching. I learned that very early in my teaching career. Each student that comes to you, each student that is in your class comes from a different background. They have a different set of, of morals. They have a different uh, set of uh, uh, skill set, if I would. Now, some of them uh, may master the material that you try to teach very, very quickly, and some of them might not. The toughest ones are the reticent ones, the ones that don't want to learn. You find out what kind of teacher you are when you can reach out to them. <laughs> Probably a lot of people, including other teachers or even students, may have thought that I was a bit weird. Go figure. I know you people that know me don't think that I'm weird in the slightest. Um, but uh, sometimes to get someone's attention, you might go outside the box. You might even go slightly out of the ordinary. And when we do that, people take notice. If I would start a class and say something really, really weird, all of a sudden ears perk up and they're going to say, what's I'm going to say next? Now I know I have my foot in the door. And so that is one of the methods. A true seeker, a true hearer, I believe, will latch on to these little tidbits. Now, if we think people are ripe for hearing, yet they show no interest, change the subject, right? Be man enough or woman enough to say, these people aren't ready right now. Maybe I need to go somewhere else. You know, being kind and being gracious in speech. Just knowing maybe that you have planted the seed will go a long way. Because who knows, sometimes seed takes a long time to germinate. Uh, <laughs> many, many years ago, in our development around the corner, uh, there's a retention pond and it's been there for, you know, the 47 years that we've lived here. Uh, in the summertime, very often the pond goes dry. I mean, dry. You can see muddy bottom, no water. In the rainy season, the level of the water goes up. Well, when my boys were about 9, 10, 11, I took them over to the pond and I had a fishing rod. 
and they were looking at me as if I was crazy. They said, Dad, that pond just dried up not too long ago. I threw that line in back and forth, and don't you know, about the third cast, I caught about a seven or eight inch pickerel, a pike. And they looked at me and said, where did that come from? That pond had dried up. Well, you know what? Either the fish laid the egg, either a bird ate an egg and defecated in the water, but somehow or another, the fish grew to be a, an adult-sized fish. You never know when a seed will be planted and how long it will take for the seed to germinate. Now, you know what? We can be sure that these, this strategy works because Jesus used it. In John chapter 4, Jesus met up with a Samaritan woman at the well. And uh, it starts in verse 7 of chapter 4. It's called a woman of Samaria. Now, you know what? He could have just jumped up and said, I'm Jesus. I'm the Savior. I'm the Messiah. Believe me. You want me to walk across the pond? But he didn't do that. He saw where the woman was, and he asked her for a drink of water out of the well. Now, Jesus could have done this himself. It was a well. He could have dipped into the well and got the water out. But he asked the woman to get the water. He knew that if he got the water and tried to talk to her, he wouldn't have as much impact. And by the way, being a Jew and her being a Samaritan, it was even extraordinary that he was talking to her to begin with. Now, once he caught her attention, the conversation moved to her salvation needs. And she was so moved by all of this, she ran into town. And in John chapter 4, verse 42, it says, I have found the Savior of the world. Jesus took her where she was, asked her to get water, and then said, I'm the living water. He took the water that she gave him and turned it around and said, if you drink of the living water, me, you will live forever. Wow, it's amazing. Not to mention, he knew about her background. <laughs> When she said she wasn't married and he uh, let her know that, uh, uh, that there were uh, uh, five husbands in her past. So uh, Jesus knew things and he went from the unknown to the known. You know, you, you never know when and where you're going to be able to reach people. I have going into hospitals, haven't been in the hospital in a year and a half now, but when I would go in to visit people in the hospital, uh, almost always, our folks are not the richest people in the world, so they don't get private rooms, uh, and they are in a room with someone else. And if that other person is awake, I will always say hello to them. I will always greet them. And when I pray with the person I am visiting, I always go to the other person and ask them if they would like to join me in prayer. Now, I do have a captive audience. They're laying in a bed. They're not going anywhere. I would say 75% to 100% of the time, they say they would like that. And what you do is, you have your foot in the door. I'm the minister of the Northfield Church of Christ, right in Northfield. I reach into my pocket, I pick out my, my quote, business card. 
I lay it on the table. I said, that's me. That's my phone number. That's my email address. And the address of the church is on there. You are always welcome at our church. And so you, you never... You never really know when opportunity knocks and a door will be opened to you. And who knows, I, I have seen people appear that I had talked to weeks or even months before. I have seen relatives of people appear that said, my sister came here and everyone was kind to her. I want to see what this is all about. There are people that sometimes come in and uh, in, in uh, church parlance, we call it, they come in to kick the tires. You know, uh, that's what people do when they go to buy a car for some reason or another. Everybody wants to kick the tires. Doesn't mean a thing. But uh, the terminology means they're just in to find out kind of what's going on. What we need to do is we need to respond to people and not react. Um, leave and take courtesy with you always. Always leave the door open for future encouragement, even if people initially decline. Offer them a card. If you don't have one, come and see me. I'll give you some cards. Give them a card. Say, I'm a member of the Northfield Church of Christ. We have a wonderful preacher there. Oh, sorry. Uh, I would introduce you to our preacher. Sorry, I couldn't resist that. Uh, sometimes our evangelistic efforts may not be amiable. And the amiable part is not our part. It's on the part of the hearer. Uh, maybe they will respond harshly and call us Bible thumpers. Uh, they'll say you walk around like you're perfect. Uh, and you know what? Uh, I hate it when people try to cram the Bible down my throat. When that happens, resist the urge to lash out. Resist even the urge to say, I'm not one of those people. Just try as hard as you can to be calm and to be courteous and to respond in a Christ-like manner. Our, our human instinct says confrontation. Ease down off of that. Resist the urge to fight back at all cost. Instead, instead, if they say, you know, I hate it when people try to jam the Bible down the, uh, your throat. And maybe you might even say uh, something like, uh, I don't blame you for hating it. I would hate that too. I would hate anybody trying to cram something down my throat that I did not want crammed down my throat. Now, some people will respond negatively no matter how they are approached. And we need to make sure that we're not critical and we're not judgmental. We should understand the situation. You know, if you smack a beehive, you're going to get stung. It is just what's going to happen. And so don't slap the beehive. A wise brother once preached the word and he said, leave the crowbars at home. All right, leave the hammers at home. Now, with that in mind, as we uh, draw near to the end of this lesson, were you raised in the church? Uh, were you raised going to church all of your life? Stop and think about your life before you became a Christian. If you were not raised in the church, guess what? At one time, you were a hearer, right? You were a hearer. 
and someone was good enough to share the word with you. Now, the truth is that, you know what? There's not a soul out there that can get to heaven without Jesus Christ. And that's the truth. Jesus said that in John chapter 14, verse 6. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. Period. Exclamation point. Put it in quotations. It's the only way to get to heaven is through Jesus Christ. Our own wisdom will lead people to the false conclusion that they can get to heaven or go to the next life without Jesus. What we have to remember are the Apostle Paul's words in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12, where he says, Our struggle is not against the flesh. He says, Our battle is against the powers of darkness and the influence of the thinking uh, the in, that influence the thinking of lost souls. Those lost souls are in the dark. Satan has a grip on them. And our struggle is not with the flesh. Our struggle is with Satan. And in Romans chapter 1, verse 16, we need to forbear. The apostle Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation. And so if a hearer will allow us that opportunity, we need to take that opportunity. Understand, there's no pre-written script. I know you can go to preachers and they have their pet ways of getting to people. I know a minister over uh, a few miles away that does things called friendship evangelism, convinced that if you make a person a friend first, then you can bring them to the Lord. And, and by the way, I think by and large, it's a true statement. It's sometimes amazing to think of human reasoning when it's compared to God's reasoning. Now understand when we're fathers and mothers, we're the gods to our parents. You know, we let our children know what time they are supposed to go to bed. We let them know what their allowance is going to be. We let them know what chores they are to complete. If you're a prospective employee, are you going to tell the owner of the company that you want to hire you, what your wages ought to be and what benefits you should get? Or even more so, are you going to tell him, well, you may not be running the company very right. I got news for you. You're not going to get that job. And so we need to use an amount of common sense. For some reason, people think that their relationship with God is to be different. You know what? God's God. He never changes. The good news of the gospel never changes. It is always the same. It is us in our approach and the readiness of the hearer. And some folks just may not be ripe to hear. The world succumbs sometimes to Satan. And we must be aware of that when we go out into the world and try to spread the gospel. It's not always easy to identify the hearers, but when we do, use tact, use the courage that you have, use kindness and politeness. Uh, don't try to jam something down someone's throat, but rather kill them with kindness. And, you know, if it doesn't work, there are other souls out there that need to be saved. And so with that in mind, uh, maybe your soul isn't saved this evening. And with that in our thoughts, uh, we offer the invitation to you. 
I'm the evangelist now. I'm the part of this three-part evangelistic effort right now. I'm the me. And I'm offering you the invitation to come to the Lord, confess Jesus as the Son of God, repent of your former ways, and be baptized for the remission of your sins. If you haven't done that, uh, get on the phone, uh, call one of us here at Northfield, and we will be at your beck and call and ready to help you. I just pray that uh, you will have a wonderful evening and uh, let's uh, close this service with a prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we're so grateful that uh, you are our God and that you have given us the clarion call to go into the world and preach the word. Help us to take that seriously and even if we, uh, you know, are not ministers, even if our words are not always great words, we can always be witnesses through the actions and through our deeds. Let's never stop doing that. I pray, dear Heavenly Father, that you would be with us through this evening. Take uh, us into your loving arms. And as we fall asleep this evening, help us to have you on our hearts. Be with us, bless us, comfort us. We pray this in Jesus' most holy name. Amen. Good evening, be safe, and may God bless you all. Praise the Lord, ye heavens above.